And now we'll have the New Testament reading. You may be seated. Hear these words that come to us from the book of Acts in the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were, they were, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. For our message, we have an anthem <clears throat> entitled, Somebody Bigger Than You and I. About maybe 20 to 30 minutes maximum outside of the city of Santa Clara in Cuba is a small village. The name of the village is Anton Diaz. And like many villages in Cuba that are outside of the cities and in the rural areas, this is just a small, it's a, a relatively small cluster of houses. The roads are dirt roads. The houses are all clustered close together. And one of the realities is that with houses so close together and without proper sanitation, their wells are all polluted. And so there's no good drinking water for the people of Anton Diaz. The, act, the household income for this village averages $12 a week. And they have to buy their water, and that averages them $5 a week. And so they have to eke out a living. The children go to school up through about eighth grade in a local school that they can walk to. However, to go to high school, they have to be able to get public transportation into the city, and they can't afford that, and it's really not available. And so in a country where high school graduates are afforded a free college education, the children of this village don't have that opportunity. In the midst of this village, though, there is an oasis of hope. La Iglesia Bethania, or the Bethany Church. The Bethany Church is this little building that has big hopes and dreams. They've already started to see some things happen. There are a few of the teachers who have some musical ability. And so they started a program where they are teaching children how to play piano and giving them something that is considered a luxury. Others are learning to play guitar. And the children find great joy in this. The little church has a plan, and they're seeking and, and a hope, and they even know where it's going to go, to put in a water purification system so they can purify the water so people don't have to be buying water that is trucked in from the outside. Their biggest challenge in that particular place is that they haven't yet convinced the government that this is a good thing. And without government approval, they can't put in their, war, their water purification system. They also have a plan, and they're carrying out a plan to enrich the lives, particularly of the women of the village. Ninety percent of the women are unemployed. 
So what they have done is the area has a lot of natural clay that is in the ground. And there's somebody who has created this business where they make these magnets that they sell all over Cuba for a couple dollars each. But this is providing meaningful work as they uh, f make these magnets that uh, depict various places in Cuba. And they found the magnetic material to put on the back from the uh, magnets that are on refrigerator doors. And they've salvaged those. And they're creating this business and putting the women to work. And they're helping to lift them out of poverty. And this all is happening because of the church in the midst of this very small, poor village. But the church is providing hope. So much hope and so much trust that God is going to work in their midst. That when I was part of a team that went in, a 15 that went and visited this just this past February, we had a celebration. It was a fiesta. And it included like a whole roast pig, which is something they don't do very often, except for maybe a holiday. And we gathered and celebrated. We had a piano recital. We had joyful time of learning about the, their ministries and their hopes and dedicating a piece of ground where their water purification system will go. And we left our love offering with them that will help to make this a reality. This is a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it is utterly amazing what God is doing in their midst because God is transforming lives because the Holy Spirit has filled the lives of people there. But is it really that amazing? You know, God's been transforming lives for centuries. This isn't a new thing. This is just the Holy Spirit at work. That expression of God's presence in our lives that transforms us and transforms others. Holy Spirit work is the work of transformation. And there's probably no better story of transformation than that which occurred on the day of Pentecost. As the Holy Spirit came upon a group of disciples, but also upon a crowd of people gathered in Jerusalem for this great festival. The Jews of Jerusalem were gathered on this day, most likely on Mount Zion. The reason is that in, on one of the days of the Feast of Weeks when they come to Jerusalem, they gather to read the book of Ruth and to hear it taught to them. Why Ruth? Because Ruth's great-grandson was King David. And not knowing King David's date of birth or death, they used the day of Pentecost to mark his birth and his death. So this is a celebration of David. David's tomb is located even today. You can visit it. It is on Mount Zion. And the people were gathered there, people from all over the known world. The Jews had made this pilgrim festival to Jerusalem. And it was here that they heard the sound of a rushing wind and the, they saw the flames, uh, the tongues as a, a fire coming down and resting upon those disciples. And those dis disciples spoke. And each could hear in their own language. Kind of an interesting phenomenon when you think about it. That someone could speak and everyone could hear in their own language and understand. And they were amazed. They... The scripture actually says that they were utterly amazed at the fact that this was happening. I actually, when I was thinking about the title of this sermon, I, I thought about renaming it slightly. It still would be utterly amazed, but this might be our poster child for the day. <laughs> you know, why are they so utterly amazed? I like the look of the cow. The cow's face is like, huh? <laughs> because they'd never seen anything like this before. 
They didn't realize the power that God could work in their lives. And the, what happened was it didn't just transform those disciples. If we went on to read further in the scripture, where they list all the different places where people came from, and Peter preaches to them, they baptize thousands on that day. Thousands of people's lives are transformed because the Holy Spirit came into the lives of those disciples. And think about who they were. The, the main disciple who kind of did the, the preaching uh, that day was Peter. Think about Peter. Not a particularly, uh, not, not exactly the person that we would uh, put before the Board of Ordained Ministry quite yet for ordination. All right? Um, he had some good qualities. He had some really good qualities. But then there were some other things about him that were a little challenging. Jesus had first called him along the shores of Galilee. His name actually was Simon, not Peter. Peter is actually the Greek word, and Petros is rock. So I don't know if Jesus was calling him the rock because he saw him as solid in a foundation, or whether it was a little bit ironic that, well, you're going to be the rock. This is the one who sunk like a rock when he stepped out of the water, uh, out on the water, out of the boat. As soon as his faith seemed to falter a little bit. And I can see him out there. Oh, you know, I'm walking out. Oh, wait a minute, I'm walking on water. And that's the end of it. Peter was the one who said to Jesus, you are the Christ, when Jesus had gone to Caesarea Philippi and asked, who do you say that I am? And, you know, and they're talking about what others are saying. Well, who do you say? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You're our chosen one, the anointed one. And then Jesus says, you're right. And now we're going to turn and go to Jerusalem where I'm going to be handed over to the authorities and I will be crucified. But three days I will be raised from the dead. And Peter then says, oh no, no, that, that's not what it means to be the Messiah. So right away he he claims that Jesus is the Christ, and then backs off from it when he learns what that means. Peter was the one who said that he would never deny Jesus and then did it three times, within hours. Peter was not there at the foot of the cross. But then again, he was one of the first ones to run to the tomb on Easter morning. He's kind of a mixed bag here. We would want to see a little more stability. We would want to see his psychological assessment and see whether he's really fit for ministry. But the Holy Spirit rushed in upon him and transformed him in such a way that he was able to transform the lives of so many on that day. What an amazing thing. What an amazing miracle. Utterly amazing that God could take someone like Peter and change things. And think about the effect of that. Why that day? Why then? Why there? Because as Peter shared the good news, as thousands were baptized, these were Jews from all over the known world. All over the Mediterranean basin that uh, where the Jews lived, the Jews from Diaspora who had been spread out centuries before, now they were going home to their villages empowered by the Holy Spirit from what happened on that day. This was not going to be just a group from Jerusalem or a group from Galilee even. This was going to be the beginning of bringing the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Perhaps what they weren't recognizing then was just how much the Holy Spirit can do. Maybe they didn't expect that the Holy Spirit was going to show up. Even though the Spirit is mentioned at the very beginning of our scriptures in the book of Genesis in the first chapter, the Spirit of God was present at creation. The Spirit was present all the way through, but the Spirit had not... Uh, caught the imagination, perhaps, of those who were gathered. On this day, the Spirit filled them. 
And they did what was unexpected. We still have the opportunity to be filled by the Spirit and to allow the Spirit to work in and around us and through us and transform not just us, but be transforming the world, transforming those in our communities and beyond who need the love of God in their lives. I pray and I hope for all of our churches and for our denomination that the Holy Spirit will be recognized as being present and will, people will allow the Holy Spirit to transform their lives. It's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't show up. That's that kind of saying that, well, God's on vacation and doesn't want to pay attention to us. No, the Holy Spirit has already shown up. It's do we recognize and do we allow the Holy Spirit to work within us? Now, I don't know how many of you even know you can do this, but if you'd like, you, know, you can watch a live stream of the United Methodist General Conference that's going on in Portland, Oregon all this past week and this coming week. And uh, I had it on for a while, not a long time. One of the nice things about not having to be present there is when you get tired of looking at it, you hit the button and you go on to do something else. But I'll tell you, I was not utterly amazed, well maybe I am utterly amazed, that as we gathered together and there's amazing worship and celebration of God's presence and then we move from that, they move from that into a discussion of the rules for operating the general conference. They spent between 10 and 12 hours debating how they were going to run the conference over a three-day period. They spent hours and hours on one rule. It's called Rule 44, in, if you read anything about this, about will we sit and talk to each other about some of the most controversial things that face our denomination today. Maybe not most important, but the most, most controversial. Twelve hours to decide they're not going to talk to each other. I'm dismayed by that. I'm utterly amazed that we can't spend our time doing something better than that. At the same time, I still have amazing hope for who we are as United Methodists, not because of what General Conference does, but because of what happens in Buttsville and Free Union and Vienna and Belvedere and Blairstown and all 61 churches of our district and the 568 or 69 churches of the Greater New Jersey Conference and what happens here in the local church. This is where the Spirit can come in, make a difference, and transform lives. Think about what has happened over the years in this congregation. Where has somebody's life been transformed? Because you have been Christ to them. Think about that. Where has somebody found hope when they were only looking at despair? Where has someone been remembered when they feel that maybe the world has forgotten them? Where has somebody experienced joy beyond just happiness? I mean, a deep abiding joy because they know they're part of a community that cares and lifts them up when they're down and celebrates with them when they're on a mountaintop. These are all ways in which the Holy Spirit is working and, and transforming lives. Where has somebody in the community that you, may ne you will probably never know by name is finding healing and hope in their lives because our churches open their doors to recovery programs like AA and NA and Al-Anon and Celebrate Recovery. Where have people found home when they don't experience it in their households? Where have people felt accepted 
when they have experienced rejection in so many other places. That's happening in our churches. It's happening here. And that's where hope is. That's what's really transforming. We can do the fanciest of worship services. We can have marching bands and everything else. But it's when the Spirit works in us, transforms us and helps us to trans transform others, that God's will is being done. I am hopeful that the Spirit has a better way than a legislative body. I mean, think about it. It's utterly amazing. It is utterly amazing that as United Methodists, we have cut the death rate for malaria in half. Now, it's still too high. But as United Methodists, we have been working on seeking to eliminate malaria on the continent of Africa. It is, a, it is possible to be done. And when we started this initiative, and we're partners with others, we're not doing it all by ourselves, but when we started it, one person died every 30 seconds. Now it's every minute. And someday it's going to be every five minutes and every ten minutes and one an hour, one a day. And maybe we will be able to eliminate this altogether. That is utterly amazing. It's utterly amazing that as a conference, we've already put 200 families back in their houses. And we are still working through Future with Hope right here in New Jersey from the aftermath of Sandy. And that, you might say, well, that was 2012. That was a long time ago. There are still tens of thousands of people whose lives have not been put back together, and we haven't left. Do you know that? A lot of organizations came in, they did what they needed to do, and they're gone. We are still there bringing hope and offering hope. That is utterly amazing. Think about how many families would be living in their cars or driving from place to place except that we have churches, and many churches in this district and beyond, working with groups like Family Promise to offer hope and say, well, we'll give you a place of temporary shelter until you get back on your feet. That is utterly amazing. Think about the fact that it's just, to me, it is utterly amazing. We have about 40 young people, youth, who live on the streets of one of the communities and walk the streets all the time in one of our communities in this district. And they are now hearing the gospel because of a basketball ministry. They're invited in to play basketball in the church and they're hearing the gospel. And some of these young people are going to repair houses at the shore and they're doing mission work now. And they're about to you know, there are plans in the works for starting a new worship service. Now, it's going to be a hip-hop service. I'm not sure how many of you want to go to a hip-hop service. And it may not be what we look at as being the ideal uh, style for worship, but if it reaches kids for Jesus Christ, isn't that what we're trying to do? Transform their lives, give them hope? And this is happening right here in our district. Sometimes we forget that in small ways, utterly amazing things happen. This magnet is one of the magnets that's made by the women in Anton Diaz. This little magnet, what a little thing this is, I could carry it in my pocket. But I asked the women who made these if God is present in their lives, and they'll tell you, see. Sí. They won't tell you yes, because they speak Spanish. <laughs> Ask the people of that community who, though living in po poverty, gathered to praise God at Bethany Church, and they celebrate a God who has not forgotten them. Ask the people who are finding hope in this, from this church if God is working in their lives. Utterly amazing things are happening. Perhaps the greatest miracle of Pentecost is not that the Holy Spirit showed up. As I said, that happens whether we ask for it or not. Perhaps the greatest miracle of Pentecost 
is that a group of people heard the good news and left Jerusalem and went to their homes and helped to transform the lives of others. May this Pentecost Day be one that is transforming for us as we open our eyes to the ways in which God is working in our midst. For the Holy Spirit is present. Can you feel it? Can you experience it? Will you receive it? Amen.